Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. It's been a while since I've done my last movie review on account of running errands uh, with the family. You know, I was actually going to several stores, like, once again, you know, and I know I mentioned it in all my previous videos. I went to Big Lots, Dollar Tree, and even Goodwill, and I found a lot of rare finds of, of movies to choose from. Yeah, I got some more Blu-rays, DVDs, and even CDs of music, because I haven't bought any music for quite some time, so I wanted to keep it up, and I hope maybe I might find some good ones to follow. Yeah, it's not easy, too, because you know, some of them have scratches, other times they're in good condition, I mean, some of them are pretty rare, I mean, it's hard. We also went to that store that does sell music, too, um, but they also sell movies as well and other stuff um, called Canterbury Records in Pasadena, California. It's, it's an old record shop, but it has everything that you like to choose from. So it's nice to know that we have an independent store that still exists. Yeah, I hope this doesn't close down. I, mean, I pray to God. I mean, we need more stores like this. We need plenty of stores like that. Okay. Um, not only that, though, but my sister actually has a brand new vinyl machine where it plays all these vinyl records. It can all eat. It's a Bluetooth one that actually has um, where you can actually like get all the the music and other stuff. To, you can even listen it for your headphones and stuff if you have the Bluetooth app and and all that stuff. But it it has it does play CDs. It does play cassettes and and you even get to listen to the radio um, perfect set tone so this will be a dream come true for my sister for everyone anyway <laughs> so we had to rush by to get some more vinyls hoping to see which one would work you know. but let's get back to that um, yesterday I went to Big Lots and one of the movies I picked up on Blu-ray is a sci-fi action thriller that came out on April 27, 2007, just a few days before my birthday, May 2nd. It was on a Wednesday. And was not a big hit at the box office. It actually flopped. Um, for its $78.1 million, it only made 76.1 so that was like almost two steps ahead it's a movie called simply next um, which is based on a Philip K. Dick story about a small time magician who has a gift the ability to see through his visions in two minutes flat, which it also leads to terrorism that's going around. They're going to set a nuclear bomb. So you got an FBI agent on his trail to find him and be able to work together to stop the terrorists. And also, he has a love interest uh, through his visions that he wants to get to know better and fall in love. And this is a pretty underrated gem. I don't see anybody talking about this. I remember seeing the trailer for the film uh, when the movie Ghost Rider came out, uh, which was another Nicolas Cage film. And yeah, Nicolas Cage at the time was doing like so many movies. I mean, apart from his Academy Award winning the role that he had with Leaving Las Vegas. I mean, of course, he's doing a lot of movies, you know, trying to keep up with the pace. And I know sometimes he does a, either a good movie, an excellent movie, or perhaps a bad movie, uh, like the Wicker Man remake, for instance. Uh, nevertheless. Um, well, I can guarantee you this is a much better film than the Wicker Man remake, but I guess if you're in for laughs, <laughs> go right ahead with the not the bees! Not the bees! <laughs> okay. Um, it does have features, of course. 
um, which has uh, the making, the best next fame, the next grand idea. Yeah, it, it just all behind the scenes featurettes that talks about how the story goes and everything, how the direction turns out and the animation that they use, the CGI effects, you know, all the these shots that they put in. They even got a two minutes into the future with actress Jessica Biel. <laughs> yeah, we already know her future. She married that idiot uh, Timber fuckface. Yeah, I know Justin Timberlake, former boy band of of Instinct, the lead singer and all, and now he has a solo album and he's now an actor. Ah, eh, whatever. And even has the visualizing the next move and the theatrical trailer to join in. That's the trailer I saw in theaters. Um, yeah, the movie was released by Paramount Pictures um, under the production of Revolution Studios, which originally they were going to release it by Columbia Pictures since they had their their financial deal with them. This is, of course, Joe Roth's production company. Um, fortunately, though, um, this movie actually had sat on the shelf for a while, um, so the studio couldn't pick it up. So that's when Paramount joined in to take over, hoping they'll do better, they'll fund it better. Uh, but it's under the, the production from Nicolas Cage's production company, uh, Saturn Films. Uh, it's also joined in with Virtual Studios. <laughs> Whatever the case, um, and I'll show show you the Blu-ray. Yep, just has the cover art, exactly alike. It's nice to know it has artwork in this one. Nowadays they'll just put in a gray disc. <laughs> no artwork at all. Coming from the the script that Gary Goldman um, joining in with Jonathan the Hensledge and Paul uh, Birnbaum. Yeah, because this. The story was called The Golden Man. Um, they were going to actually use um, something very similar to the story was that the government agency was about to capture a pre native mutant, which this is what the character Chris Johnson is, which we did learn that his love interest was apparently a mutant herself, uh, born in a love canal. So the only woman who can actually have met who can have children herself and capable of procreating all these normal humans around. And they actually used the Department of Homeland Security agents, DHS, to to have their search to to prevent uh, terrorism that's going around who are on the case to actually stop a terrorist group from from bringing the war of terrorism around um, the country. And of course, the script itself had anti authoritarian themes. Which, that's why they had to change the script. Um, already been redrafted by Saturn. Which now they had to eliminate the those themes and decided to go for a whole different idea where the character is actually a social outcast, a meek type, somehow portrayed as arrogant, less sympathetic in a way, it's now being replaced by the FBI. They were on a case trying to target him, thinking that he might be part of this, this terrorism, but actually, he might be the key to actually stop him. You almost make, make the FBI agents look pretty bad. That particular story got the attention of the studio for a revolution. And that's how they got Nicolas Cage along with uh, Julianne Moore and Jessica Biel to be cast. And that's how it went. <laughs> anyway, let, let's get to the review. It stars Nicolas Cage, Julianne Moore, Jessica Biel, Thomas uh, Kretschmann, um, who, of course, was in a movie called Re Resident Evil Apocalypse. He was in The Pianist and Downfall. Tori uh, Kittles, 
Um, you may remember him from Malibu's Most Wanted, and and he went on to do other stuff too, like True Detective and Son of Anarchy. Peter Falk, you know, from Columbo. Um, he was a great actor. I miss him already. Uh, Jim Beaver, Ilzo Calanti. Um, he was in the the Fury of, yeah, he was in a movie called The Fury of Anything, and Games of Thrones later on. Jason Butler, Hammer, and Jose Saninga. Yeah, it's written by Gary Goldman, who actually had work on another uh, script from that's based on the Phil K. Dick novel, which is Total Recall. He also did Big Trouble in Little China, Navy Seals, uh, among many others that he wrote. Uh, Jonathan Hensledge, who actually uh, had wrote screenplays for Jumanji, yeah, the original Jumanji, and as well as Die Hard with the Vengeance, and, and of course Armageddon. But he also directed um, The Punisher from 2004, which I really enjoy and love. Um, and Paul uh, Birnbaum, and it's directed by Lee Tamahori. If you're familiar with this director, he actually gave us a movie called Once for Warriors, but he also directed the underrated um, Mulholland Falls, the one with Nick Nolte, Chaz Palminteri, uh, Jennifer Connelly, Melanie Griffin, Kyle Chandler, John Malkovich, Treat Williams, Michael Madsen, Chris Penn, yeah, the entire cast. It's an excellent movie. Uh, a film noir too. And he also directed The Edge, uh, which was um, written by David Mammoth, you know, which stars um, Anthony Hopkins and and Alec Baldwin. Yeah, it's a survival of the fittest movie. And and then he uh, did Along Came a Spider, yeah, which is an Alice Cross film with uh, Morgan Freeman. It's a sequel to Kiss the Girls based on the novel by James Patterson. And yes, he did direct the Die Another Day, uh, the James Bond film with Pierce Brosnan, Holly Berry's in this, along with Michael Madsen, um, Roseman Pike, uh, long before she became well known for other films, and, and of course, Triple X, Stay of the Union, the sequel to Triple X, which had been Diesel. But this one had uh, Ice Cube, a terrible movie. So, of course, he did this one. <laughs> the movie begins where we meet a man named Chris Johnson, who's played by Nicolas Cage, who can see his own future through the visions uh, in two minutes flat, with the exception of a vision that he once had with a woman, who turned out to be Liz, played by Jessica Biel, his love interest who's walking into the diner, who eventually would be the one who's going to be strapped in into a wheelchair with bombing explosives um, by the terrorist group that's going to happen somewhere in downtown L.A. Um, well, it, at least that's exactly how he visions. Knowing no detail at the time, he goes into the diner twice a day to see if she'll show up but then throughout the entire night yeah he works as a small-time magician in Las Vegas you know performing all these magic acts that he can do it's given a stage name Frank Cadillac he also supplements his income with gambling you know using his powers to win millions against the house until Suddenly, a FBI agent named Kali Ferris, played by Julian Moore, had drawn the attention of him to figure out his ability to stop these Russian terrorists from a terrorist act that's going to happen by setting a nuclear bomb and detonating it. But before she can approach him, his gambling draws the attention of the casino securities agents around. I mean, they all spotted him. Um, 
even with the scene where he visions um, how this one guy was about to shoot these two um, workers at the casino. So he was about to attack him and try to grab the gun before the FBI agents and the Las Vegas police were on his trail. They're chasing him around. He stole a valet um, car, so he drove into this one big chase scene, going all the way straight into his home, which this is where he actually cheats his way out by vision, uh, hoping he can make it through without being avoid the crashing straight into the locomotive. So he made it though somehow. And then he finally made it where we get to meet I, I think it might be his father. Never explain much, but he's a mechanic named Irvine, who's played by Peter Falk. A very small role. Collie suddenly uh, tracked him on his trail to explain that he wants to actually hire him to find out where the terrorists are at or maybe because he's going to be the target of them all you know, for his future especially since they already saw the performance of uh, what he did uh, inside the casino security um, this Ferris already did track this location but he escapes after foreseeing her arrival and later that night the casino security chief has been approached by two terrorists who interrogated him and just killed him directly because they're about to go after Chris. The following morning, Chris is at the diner again and spotted Liz and tried to make a great comp impression with her until her aggressive ex-boyfriend shows up and trying to tell her to leave and all. And started almost about to brutally attack her because she didn't want to be able to to get involved with in anymore so Chris decided to use his visions to actually attack him or try to avoid the fight but at the end he gets sock in the face by her boyfriend and, and that's where well probably the only impression he'll get <laughs> I, I still prefer the one where, you know, he actually uh, was about to attack him in a fight, and then somehow, uh, and trying to impress her better, and and then actually pay for the dinner by having all the coins fall out of his sleeve. I mean, that was pretty clever. And trying to avoid the fight, and and he gets to do his uh, techniques, you know, to avoid it. I mean, that's just awesome. So now, uh, once they met, met together, uh, Chris and Liz decided to drive off to Flagstaff, Arizona. That's where we go straight into the canyons where she actually lives. Um, they actually um, live inside a uh, the cliffhanger um, hotel where, where they're about to stay. Um, and um, we. Before that, um, they went inside the canyon, so we get to meet all of her Indian friends, all the kids around. They were also celebrating a birthday from this young boy. Uh, they introduced him to Chris. I mean, they even had a premonition to say that that Chris actually f loves Liz and all. Um, even the Chris actually uh, performs a magic uh, trick to this young boy. And would you turn this magic walk into a lizard? That was really cute. So anyway, they, they went to the, the cliffhanger, the hotel they're about to stay at. Um, so, you know, they made love. They they went shopping. I had some breakfast and all. I mean, love at first sight in, in a way. Um, while, Car while Ferris... Um, along with her FBI team and even the terrorists has to join in are about to go on his trail which unfortunately Liz event which eventually Liz uh, got involved in this so 
that's what led to the secret when Liz was just about to go shopping, you know, to grab some groceries, you know, for breakfast, you know, bring some orange juice and all, until got caught by, you know, Ferris, and they're about to actually uh, tell uh, her that uh, Chris is a sociopath and they want her to drug him so they can bring him in. Yeah, but then she realized that because she found out the truth about what just happened while she was shopping. Um, that they were going to drug him and take him away. So this is where we Chris reveals the secret while both uh, Ferris and her team and even the terrorists were already broadcasting the frequency so they'll get to hear their conversation. He actually blocks it by turning on the TV and s switching channels and he, just to show her that you know, he, he begins to know everything. I mean, he begins to see the future through dialogue after dialogue. So it's, it's like a time warp in a way. So now he knows that he has the ability. So, in order to protect her, though, because so she wouldn't get involved, um, apparently uh, Ferris was chasing him along with the team, and even the terrorists has to join uh, where he jumps off of the cliff and tries to avoid all the gunshots like the assassin was about to shoot him and he actually avoid that doing all these ballet techniques and stuff I mean it causes like an avalanche where uh, Liz actually start up the SUV and then it starts to roll around down into the hill along with the wagons and and all these um, statues uh, rolling down. Chris was about to avoid that. Everyone eventually they end up getting killed or so. But they're trying to escape from this avalanche and then once he made it down <laughs> well the the vehicle just flips around. Ferris came and told him um, are you gonna let me die? <laughs> but he eventually saves her and that's where they, they took her that's when she took uh, him in and put him into a torture chamber thinking that she's the bad guy which is very similar to what you saw in A Clockwork Orange you know how they always uh, t they strap him inside the, the chair they they put him inside these uh, one of these tools so, so they can make him open his eyes you know they force him into it well, they were doing that with uh, Chris, and he was, and Ferris was trying to f force him to actually trying to have the ability to to see where he could find the bomb and be able to stop the terrorists, just giving him his worst nightmare, and that's where he gets to see it directly through the TV, and this is a news report where it indicates that where Liz is actually strapped in wearing those bomb explosives into the the wheelchair and was ready to set off getting killed and hoping that he'll be able to avoid that which is going to happen two hours from now so after that he escapes you know just started to trick uh, all these uh, officers around and just uh, started to attack them and, and everyone and then about to escape going straight directly to downtown LA where this is where the events gonna happen which hasn't happened yet but he had no choice but to join with uh, Ferris and the and the team to stop him as soon as they can and also since Liz has been kidnapped by the terrorists they're gonna try to find a way to save her but it's not gonna be easy and I'm going to leave it at that. But the story may be contrived, and that's understandable. I mean, it, it is convoluted, and it even has a cop-out, anticlimactic ending towards it, which that needs to be fixed. I mean, it sort of cheats its way out for the audience, and I can see why people felt that way. I felt that way as well, but... It wasn't frustrating for me to follow that. What I really followed, however, was that this was a very clever story. 
you know. And I liked the idea that they went for. And I thought Nicolas Cage was terrific in this performance that he did. You know, Chris Johnson, you know, he isn't a social outcast himself. I mean, I wish they had explained him a little bit better on how did he got this power. Maybe they could explain indifferently, like maybe he got it as a kid or something, or you know, maybe he was born this way. That sort of uh, situation, but I, I understand. I mean, they they want to make this movie, you know, quite as fast-paced as possible, and not trying to get too involved with all this other dramatic themes in in the elements here. Um, that's the case. Uh, Julia Moore was also uh, great as um, the uh, the very tough uh, FBI agent, Collie Ferris, almost as a, uh, a variation of her Clarice Starling in Hannibal, which was, of course, a replacement to Jodie Foster for her Academy Award-winning role in The Science of the Lambs. And, but I thought Julia Moore did an excellent job, too, in a way. Um, but of course, you can't top Jodie Foster's performance <laughs> in a case. Um, so I thought she worked well. As for uh, Jessica Biel, well, I could have had settled for a better actress to play that role. Like, they should have got um, Rachel McAdams or Jennifer Gardner to play that part. This would have worked well. Would have had terrific chemistry with Nicolas Cage. You know, through their ages. I mean, I just felt like Jessica Biel was a little too young to to play uh, Cage's interests, and also because she's pretty wooden. I mean, she's pretty. She's beautiful. I mean, she's attractive, but I mean, she's not bad. I mean, she's fine, but even with her role that she's did, but I just thought she was pretty wooden and. I, I deserve a lot better for, for him. But again, it's, it's my opinion. Um, the villains in the movie were nothing special, but it, hey, you're not expecting much anyway, because that's exactly part of the story here. Um, but I l really enjoyed the special effects that they did. I mean, Eventually, Nicolas Cage did provide his own stunts to do with a stunt coordinator. You know, he, he wore the harness to actually jump off of the cliff, trying to see if he can make it through. And he does all these techniques, you know, he moves around, you know, trying to avoid, like, all of that, too. Like, bullet uh, holes and, you know, like, like if the bullet was going to hit him or avoid all these fights. And he's trying to do what he can to control himself. I mean, he can, he can do anything. I mean, he, he cheats his way out to try to avoid, you know, all these mistakes. Uh, there's even a scene where he actually uh, splits himself like, like he's a clone. Like he's cloning, like, several versions of himself, you know, trying to check uh, into the facility, you know, where all the bad guys are headed or, or even the, uh, the bombs and, and all that's being set to. And also to try to um, help out uh, Ferris try to track down these bad guys so they could shoot him. Uh, joining him with his, her team to shoot everyone. <laughs> and also trying to find where Liz is being headed to so they can save her life. That was just incredible. But therefore, um, I love the, the clever plot that they went into. I love the idea. Um, but I think the film needs to need to be fixed a bit to make it more you know, subtle and uh, coherent in a way and, and to explain the story uh, in a much better pace. Um, but it did have the narration that Cage had provided, so that's cool. I, I even love the line, you know, every time you look in the future, it changes. And it does. <laughs> The way he sees it. Um, so nevertheless, um, it's a good film, very decent, but it's not, you know, the greatest movie ever made, 
an excellent action thriller, but it's pretty close. So let's leave it at that way. I give next three stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.